Today's presenter is Adam Mayer. He's one of the three founders, along with Zach Hooken and Breed Pettis, of MakerBot Industries. And they're attempting to take 3D fabrication technology and put it in the hands of the hobbyist. So without further ado, uh, Adam Mayer, one of the three founders. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> We've actually been at Maker for the past two days, um, and we probably talked to a couple thousand people over the course of uh, the weekend, so <clears throat> I'm going to try to uh, to speak naturally without my voice giving out. Um, so I'm Adam Mayer. This is Zach Hoken right here. And uh, Brie Pettis, unfortunately, can't be here today, but the three of us are the juggernaut of uh, the 3D printing industry known as MakerBot Industries. And the primary thing we make right now is this wonderful device, MakerBot. Um, You'll see one on the table right there, illuminated with uh, red LEDs and looking quite nice. So MakerBots are machines for making things. Right now, you'll see this one here is, is equipped with a little, um, a, uh, what we call a plastruder, a small device for ex extruding uh, various uh, plastics, ABS, PLA, etc. And right now it's configured as a 3D printer. Uh, this is its primary use right now, but uh, ideally, the cupcake, which is actually what this particular model of MakerBot's called, can be used for any kind of uh, 3D positioning tasks. We used to use it, uh, we have a, a frost uh, Brie actually created a tool head that extrudes frosting so it can decorate cupcakes, which is how it got its name. Um, they're portable. I'm not sure if you guys have seen uh, 3D printers that other projects create, but uh, they tend to be huge, they tend to be very heavy, and we can fit this in a Pelican case and move it around. Uh, we actually bought three out here to uh, San Mateo the other day. Um, one of them is currently en route back to New York. Uh, another one is somewhere in San Francisco. Um, and this one's here. So um, let me kind of explain what we're trying to do uh, with MakerBot. Right now, as I, as I pointed out, um, the current crop of devices ex are extremely heavy, they're extremely expensive. If you're looking at the dimension printers, you're talking about twenty to forty to sixty thousand dollars for a machine. Um, and you're not going to have one in your home. Uh, you're not going to get one, put it in the garage, and start printing out things when you need things. Uh, what we'd like to see is a future where everyone can have one of these. I mean, the future was supposed to be very different. We were supposed to have flying cars. We were supposed to have space colonies orbiting the moon. We were supposed to have jet packs. We were supposed to have replicators that could give us anything we wanted whenever we wanted it. And uh, so we got the last one, is basically what I'm saying. Or at least we're working on it. Um, MakerBot is, as I pointed out before, Zach. Uh, Brie Pettis is there, second to right. That's me. I think this is either just before or just after an all-nighter. And uh, the gentleman right there, you'll see, second from left, is Adrian Bauer. He's uh, the founder of the RepRap project. Has anyone here heard of RepRap? A few? OK. RepRap was a, is a similar project with the express goal of creating a 3D printer that anyone could build that could actually create its own parts. This is a child project of the RepRap. The RepRap looks like this. Um, it's not terribly transportable, uh, but it does work. Um, this design is actually based on a RepRap. Zach has been working under the aegis of the RepRap Foundation for several years developing uh, the circuit boards and extruder design for this project. Uh, and the boards you'll see on this machine, you'll see they actually say, you know, RepRap motherboard, RepRap controller. These are actually boards that we share with the RepRap project. Likewise, the extruder can be used on RepRap machines, and we can use RepRap tool heads as well. Um, the problem with RepRap is it's a little large, it's a little unwieldy, and it's not exactly the sort of thing you can, uh, you can put together yourself too easily. It takes a lot of tweaking. So we decided we'd try to make that a little bit simpler. Uh, these are our first two prototypes. Uh, from left to right, the one on the left is our actually first prototype ever. Uh, we usually refer to that one as Eve. And the one to right on the right is, uh, it's not exactly the production MakerBot you see here, but it is uh, a slightly later version. Um, so as you can see, we can sort of flip the design. Uh, if you go back to the original RepRap, you'll see it moves the tool head on an XY carriage and then raises that platform on the bottom. That's the build platform that the object you're printing sits on. And it raises and lowers that object. The problem with doing that is that the tool head is usually pretty heavy. It's a few pounds. And it's also probably the most delicate part of the machine. And what you're doing is you're shaking it around a lot, moving it around. And you're producing an object that usually weighs a few ounces. So uh, one of the things we did is we sort of inverted the design. 
if you look inside the Microbot there, you'll see there's actually an XY table that moves on the bottom, and the tool head is mounted on a Z platform that goes up and down. Um, so the prototype on the left, I think we finished, what is it, early March, late February? And uh, Bree took it down to South by Southwest to demo it. And he took it around, he showed it to a bunch of people and everyone loved it. And they were asking questions all the time, like, you know, what's the build area? And he looks at it and he says, I don't know, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. And we come back, he comes back and we measure it and it was uh, not quite 10 centimeters square, which is why the MakerBot on the right is uh, significantly larger than the MakerBot on the left. We need to expand the build area a bit. Uh, other changes that happened between generations, uh, it's really difficult to see in this picture, but um, Originally, the uh, Y stage motor was actually mounted uh, sideways, essentially, on the X stage. And that meant that the whole X stage was torqued slightly. It was a little overbuilt, so we moved the steppers around. And the design on the right is actually pretty close to what we have now. So it's an open source design. Um, all our hardware is open source. All our software is open source. You can just go right now, uh, and we have several resources we'll show you towards the end where you can actually go and just download all our designs and start playing. Uh, you don't necessarily need to get a kit from us. It's, we recommend it because getting all the parts together is a tremendous pain. But uh, you can make modifications to your heart's content. If you've got a laser cutter, you can cut a lot of the parts yourself. Um, Marius Kintel uh, from Metal Lab has been in New York for the past week, and he did his own version of the outer, the outer casing here, where he put teeth in all the apertures, apparently to warn people away from reaching in and grabbing the objects he'd printed. Or maybe it's a trap. He'd like print out a precious figurines, you know, a precious moments figurine, and have it bite your arm off or something. We tried to get it. Um, so the great thing about that is, um, people are going to do things with this that we can't imagine. Um, people ask us, well, why would I need one of these? And we can think of a few stock answers. I'll actually show you a few of the stock answers in a minute. But um, the other side of that is that. Uh, the best answer we can come up with is, we don't know. We're just trying to get this into people's hands. Uh, you could go back in time to 1976 and try to explain to Steve Wozniak uh, what 4chan is, but it wouldn't work. He wouldn't know what the heck you were talking about or why what he was working on was going to in some way lead to that. Um, hmm? We don't need 4chan. We don't need 4chan, but it happened anyway. So we, we don't know what the consequences of this. There's going to be a lot of things that we don't need coming out of this project. We're, in fact, we've seen a lot of them already. Um, that's OK. That's probably a, a, a yes, that's a better analogy, a more, a more recent analogy. Although you could probably explain that to him you know, within an afternoon without completely blowing his mind. So <clears throat> anyway, like we say, it is hackball the box. I mean, this is mostly just a crazy paint job. But you can put whatever tool head you want on there. And uh, people have already started doing things like trying to mount milling heads on their mill foam. Um, we haven't done that yet ourselves because uh, I don't think the XY can really provide enough force for any serious milling, like milling metal, which some people have asked if they can do. Um, but let me show you some of the things that people have been doing with this. Um, way before there was a MakerBot, Zach and Bree set up a site um, called Thingverse. And um, Thingverse is basically a site where people can share digital designs. So if you create, you know, uh, yesterday at Maker Faire, uh, Bree whipped up a little coin that we could print quickly and give away at the show. And so he uploaded to Thingverse so other people could build them. And we actually have a fairly large community of people now just making things and making copies of things. And uh, some of them are fantastic. Like this is. Um, Philip, who's also been in town for the past month, uh, created a script for generating Lego bricks. <clears throat> now we primarily print in ABS, which is the same thing Lego bricks are, are made of, so that enabled him to actually print out Lego bricks. And these, uh, you can actually see them interoperating with <clears throat> official Lego brand bricks in, in this shot here. And uh, he actually wrote this, he wrote a parameterized modeling uh, plug into Art of Illusion. Has anyone used AOI at all? It's not a terribly popular 3D modeling program, but it is, it is open source. Um, here's another fun thing he uh, generated with that. This is, um, actually, I think Zach has one in his pocket here. These are little uh, screwable boxes. These would be very difficult to actually mill or create through a traditional manufacturing technique. You don't know where it is? Oh, no, I thought you were saving it. But uh, we can print one out later. It's OK. 
Um, but these are basically two parts that screw into each other. So it's, it's a little jewelry box, essentially. You can hide things inside. Um, and they're fun for a number of reasons. It also kind of showcases the precision of the MakerBot itself. These things, you can actually print out the different halves on different machines, and uh, they'll fit together nicely. Unless, of course, as we did one day, we had a, one of the uh, steppers reversed, and so it had the wrong chirality. That was kind of embarrassing. <clears throat> uh, but the things I love most are the banal things. Uh, Bree and Zach were actually uh, giving a talk a few weeks ago. Where exactly was it? Uh, MIT. I think, uh, yeah, MIT. And uh, they forgot the tweezers. Uh, we use tweezers when we have this thing as true. We put out a little test noodle of plastic to make sure it's running before we actually print an object. And we have tweezers so we can reach in and bink, pull out the little extrusion and not burn our fingers. And, well, if you leave the tweezers behind, the best thing to do is to print out new tweezers, which is what we did here. Um, Zach actually made this design as a derivative of another design that someone else had made earlier and uploaded. So because someone uploaded their tweezers to Thingverse, we could download their tweezers, make the changes we needed, uh, print out the tweezers, and use the tweezers. Um, here's another one. Someone has started making a set of lens caps for their telescopes, because that's something you tend to lose easily. And you don't necessarily want to mail order one or wait to go to the hardware store. OK, you print one out. Uh, and here's my personal favorite right now is uh, bath plug. Uh, someone actually created the bath plug. They rendered it in, you know, in Blender, SketchUp, whatever. They printed it out, and uh, they took a bath. So we've contributed to making, you know, cleaner nerds. Yeah, which is, I think, nothing, no, open, no other open source project has done that yet. So we're sort of moving into new ground here. I've, a friend of mine has been asking for a Utah teapot for a very long time, actually. I keep meaning to get to it. One of the few limitations we have right now is we don't have a support material extruder, so doing overhangs is still a little difficult because we have to use as support material the same material we're printing with. All right, was that? All right, but back to um, back to the slideshow. So let me talk a bit more about um, what exactly this machine can do and what it's capable of. Um, the build area is about 10 centimeters to a side on the x and y axis. It's actually slightly larger on the z axis. So uh, you can see actually one of the nice things about it is um, the extruder can actually rise out of the top of the box there. So you can move that platform almost all the way up to the top. You can get close to 13 uh, centimeters. I think this, uh, this particular model is 13 centimeters. You have a little competition going on for the, the tallest build that people have done yet with a, with a BakerBot. Um, it's really easy to move. We have a uh, Pelican case for each of our demo machines right now. So we toss it in here at the end of the day. Um, you let the TSA know what it's about so they don't destroy it. And uh, as we discovered on the way here, they destroy one of them anyway. And, um, but you can also see how much it weighs there. It's about 42 pounds in the case. It's about 20 pounds without. Um, but they're fairly sturdy. Uh, one of the disadvantages that the RepRap had, as you saw, it was a mass of threaded rod, corner brackets, nuts, bolts, delicate components sticking out top. When you lower the stage there, that thing's just a compact box. And it's not actually indestructible, but it's pretty easy to get around without uh, blowing it up, melting it down, breaking it in half. And yes, and it looks great. You can fill it with LEDs and just have it sitting there at night on your desk, and people will walk by and say, my god, someone really cool sits there. And they'll be right, because, <laughs> because even if you're not cool, you can print out something that will make you cool. And Thingiverse has plenty of designs that will make you cool. Uh, this is our sort of warehouse space in Brooklyn. We share it with a couple of other businesses right now, but uh, all of these are lovingly packed by hand. And um, used to be we, we packed them with care. Now we pack them with care and a lot of shipping tape because uh, we've discovered that USPS is not the most reliable um, service in the world when it comes to respecting fragile labels on the side of your box. Um, we actually had a lot of busted bits showing up in the first batch. Um, and this is actually the, what we call the kit of kits. This is what we ship with, uh, or at least we shipped with our first generation of MakerBots. Uh, you can see here, this is, a, this is an obsolete picture because these bits here are what we call our pulley kit. We used to assemble pulleys out of several layers of wood, and those were just our tensioning pulleys for keeping the belts tight. If you look at this machine, you'll notice on top two sort of strange looking semi-translucent plastic knobs. Those are actually, uh, we printed those out of PLA. Those are the new pulleys. We actually now print the pulleys that we ship with the machine on the machine. 
Uh, it turns out it's faster, it's easier, there are less parts to lose, and uh, the parts of the pulleys tend to break, and uh, the ABS that we print them out of now doesn't. Um, let me actually go through this real quick and show you what, what we're talking about here. This is, uh, these are laser cut parts for the outer case. Uh, these are build platforms, and uh, these are also becoming obsolete. Uh, one of the tricks with extruding ABS is that ABS loves to stick to itself and it hates to stick to anything else. So what we used to do is uh, ship with a bunch of these foam core plates that we'd cut out. And there's a thin plastic layer on top of that foam core that the ABS would stick to quite reliably. And then it would print out the object on top of it. You didn't have to worry about the object shifting around during a print or peeling itself off. Uh, the problem is that you could only print out once or twice on one of these build bases before you had to flip it over or put it aside. We've lately actually discovered that if you etch acrylic uh, well enough, it will stick even better to that, and you can reuse that. We've reused the ones we have here probably a good hundred times easily. Um, <clears throat> this is the, uh, the electronics kit. Again, it's a, it's a bag full of bags. Uh, each of those bags represents one of the boards on the side of that thing. Right now, as you'll see, we're going <coughs> to show you how we put those boards together, or rather you put those boards together. In the future, uh, those boards are going to come pre-assembled. So that is going to be simplified as well. Um, we've got our power supply, standard ATX power supply. Uh, the one we shipped out here did not stand up too well to, uh, to the, the graces of the USPS, but um, any ATX power supply will do. Um, we've got our small bits bag. This is the XY stage laser cut parts. This bag here is the plastruder, the plastic extruder you see on top there. Uh, a few cables. This is what we call the hardware burrito. There are hundreds and hundreds of bolts in this thing, and so we make a little kit of all those. And the, uh, the rods that support the XY bearings and also the threaded rod that lifts and lowers the Z. Uh, we use T-slots to hold it, all this together. Um, it turns out if you originally were going to start making these out of acrylic, acrylic looks great, it's pretty easy to cut, it's very reliable. Um, but the problem about acrylic is that it tends to, as Zach puts it, it's a binary fail. If you tighten an acrylic part, uh, not an acrylic part too much, it's going to crack and you've got a broken part and you're kind of screwed. Um, wood conforms, wood bends, wood warps. And because we're using wood, we could use these simple T-slots to actually make a really strong connection on the corners. The slots over there on either side of the bolt keep the part in place. We slide the nut in, get the ball down, tighten it down, and it locks in pretty easily. Uh, and those are really easy to put together, well, relatively easy to put together, so uh, most of the bulk of this goes together pretty quickly. Um, the boards are primarily surface mount boards. Uh, we ship them as kits, and people freak out when they see uh, 100 surface mount parts. It turns out soldering surface mount parts is extraordinarily easy. You put down solder paste, you put the pieces on top of them, and you throw them on a hot plate. You heat them up carefully, you don't burn the board, and you're pretty much okay. Uh, the trickiest part for us has been these capacitors here because they tend to conduct heat away from the board and you need to keep the heat applied for a longer period to get the solder under those to finally melt and pop. Um, we are actually moving towards replacing these surface mount caps, the big ones, with through hole caps just because they're easier to get soldered, but uh, everything else here is actually pretty simple. Uh, the biggest, the other big issue of course is chip caps, which people tend to get confused with one another. And does everyone know the trick for telling two uh, chip capacitors apart? If you've got them mixed up, you oh. throw them away. Yeah, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You toss them. You you toss them and you order new ones from DigiKey, and, and that's basically your solution. Um, and that works, unfortunately, all too well for us. Um, we've shipped MakerBots pretty much all over uh, Canada, much of the U.S., uh, Austria. I think Austria should be in here somewhere. Ah, okay. It's an old nap. This is before we shipped to Austria. Um, Spain, France, Australia, we have a few orders in Japan. Um, and these things are really getting all over the place. Uh, we're starting to develop a community of people who are corresponding about MakerBots, how to work out kinks they've run into, you know, what sort of designs they've come up with, what they've been using them for. And it's, it's very handy for us because it means that a lot of issues before we even, they even get to us, they send out you know, mail to the MakerBots operators list and someone else says, oh, I had that problem and here's how I fixed it. Um, so they're a really wonderful community of people. Um, so let's talk a bit about the materials we've been using in the plastic router. Uh, our primary material has been a white ABS plastic. Like I say, that's what Legos are made out of. If you step on a Lego, you know that it's strong, it's hard. Um, 
and it's pretty difficult to destroy something you've been printing out of ABS. Um, these are, I guess these are Stanford bunnies here. Uh, again, the overhangs mean the, uh, the ears came out a little fuzzier than they usually do for most bunnies. But you can also see these are early prints, uh, dodecahedron and another parameterized box. Um, we've played with HTTP for a while. It's a little oozy, it doesn't uh, cool quite as quickly, and so it's, it's been a little more difficult to print with. We haven't spent too much time with it. Uh, PLA is a lovely one. Uh, Adrian Bauer, that picture you saw earlier, he on that trip he came by with a big old roll of PLA and he said, you guys have got to play with this. It's great, it, you know, it melts easily, it's, it's tough, it's biodegradable, and it smells like butter when you heat it up, which is <laughs> true and amazing. It, it's much better smelling than ABS. Um, but yeah, PLA is great. It's uh, got a slightly lower temperature uh, melting point than, uh, than ABS, and uh, it is, people like to say it's biodegradable. You actually need to put it in an acidic environment and heat it up a bit for it to really biodegrade, but in theory, it's, it's a little friendlier to the environment. It's also completely biocompatible, which is nice. Uh, they use this in, for making uh, scaffoldings for growing cells on. Um, and we have black ABS. It has all the properties of white ABS, but it's a different color. And um, we just got a bunch of this, and it's, it's super fun, because now when you print out a Darth Vader head, people actually recognize it as a Darth Vader head, <laughs> rather than you know some sort of strange robot thing. Um, ABS, they actually do manufacture in a, in a range of colors, um, but we, we get this directly from a manufacturer, and uh, you need to order a fair amount. You know, before they'll start doing custom colors for you. But we hope to have red sometime fairly soon because it's important that we have, I think red, purple, and green are the ones we're looking for. They're the ones I'm looking for. Pink, and we want pink. All right, so let me walk you through the process of actually printing something out on the MakerBot here. And uh, Zach, do you actually want to, like, in parallel, start, start a print maybe in a minute? OK, let's wait till we get there. All right. <clears throat> so you create a model in any 3D uh, program you choose. You guys would probably use SketchUp because you have a vested interest. Um, but uh, I tend to use Blender because it's an open source uh, program. And since all our hardware and software is open source, it really adds to our argument that we have in the tool chain an open source 3D modeler. Uh, you can use anything that exports STL, which is basically anything nowadays. Uh, Art of Illusion will export STL, SolidWorks, obviously, uh, Blender, SketchUp. Um, I can't really think of any. 3D programs that don't. Uh, it's, it's pretty much the standard for, sorry, lithography files are pretty much the standard for exporting 3D objects to printers nowadays. So what we do then is pass it through a uh, Python script called SkinForge. What SkinForge does is it takes that model and it slices it into thin layers at our layer height and comes up with a tool path. Essentially, it's going to figure out where exactly it's going to move the build base as it starts extruding plastic. And you can see these. Uh, when it's done, it actually gives you a nice preview here, and you can see the arrows tracing out the path that the, uh, the tool head is going to use. The colors actually are related to the speed it's going to move the tool head as it, uh, as it does the layer. So this is a full layer of the model you just saw. What this actually outputs is G-code. Um, people know G-code? Familiar with it? Heard of it? All right, G-code is a very uh, old, it's hardly even a standard, really. It's just sort of a, a de facto standard that evolved over years. Uh, but it's used for, uh, by almost all CNC machines. And essentially, you know, you'll see an example of it in a second. It's not terribly verbose, but it does work. But essentially, it's, a, it's full of a, a set of commands. You can see them here, G1 commands, which essentially say, move the, uh, move the three axis controller to this point, now this point, now this point, now this point. Um, to actually do that interactively from the machine would you know, be uh, a little, Iffy, so what we actually have is a big point buffer inside the firmware on the motherboard over there. And that buffer gets loaded up, and the machine then just pulls out that buffer. We keep the buffer full, and we don't run into any snags. It doesn't jump or stop when your host computer has uh, some trouble. So we don't actually parse the G code nowadays directly on this uh, board. What we do instead is we pass it to a program called Replicator G. Um, Replicator G essentially reads in the G code, interprets it, and talks to the driver that's actually on that chip over a standard serial connection. You'll see uh, <coughs> the cables we use to, um, to, program, to get the data to the machine. Those are standard uh, FTTI chips. They're just uh, standard serial connections over a USB line. Um, has anyone here used Arduino environment at all? A couple of people? OK. That's the same cable you use to program Arduino. In fact, the chip that's on our motherboard is uh, 
It's actually Sanguino, which is an Arduino derivative that Zach developed primarily, I think, for this. Um, and Sanguino was uh, essentially a slightly better chip. I think it's a 644 and uh, with more memory, more pins. Uh, but it's also uh, a bit of a pain to maintain. Uh, the Arduino people have now started using an even more advanced chip with more pins, and they're selling it as the Mega Arduino. And we're probably going to transition to that at some point. But the, the point is that um, when you actually upgrade the firmware in there, you're doing it through the Arduino environment. And all the actual firmware for the motherboard is written in the Arduino environment. So you can just use that same cable to upload new firmware to your machine. Um, so Replicator G uh, has a sort of smorgasbord of silly features. It's got a control panel that will allow you to manually control things, test things out. Before we get started, we usually like to just you know raise things up and down on the Z X axis, make sure everything's working, especially when we take it out of the box after moving it. <clears throat> and you can also uh, control the temperature of the extruder here. We like to, first thing we usually do actually is crank up the temperature, uh, ABS. We like to extrude it usually about between 210 and 220 degrees Celsius. Uh, so we'll crank up the temperature, wait for it to heat up, and then start the extruder, make sure that noodle of plastic is working out well. And then when you're done, you just hit the uh, build button and you can actually build an object. And then you have a watch which you've always wanted, that doesn't actually tell time. Um, but you've wanted it anyway for a long time because it makes you cool. Um, so uh, actually, do you want to do a build real quick? Let's do a build. You don't want to do a build. We do, oh, fine. Okay, we're almost done with this part though. Um, so we do sell uh, the whole kit, basically everything you see there to assemble that is 750 bucks. Um, and if you have any kind of shop tools or electronic tools, you can usually put it together by yourself. Uh, but we sell a docs kit that also includes all the tools you might need to put it together. The hex wrenches, the solder paste. Um, you know, we have a, a really cool LED lit visor with magnifying uh, lenses in it so you can actually see what the heck you're doing. Uh, lots of plastic. And we also have started selling them uh, fully assembled for ridiculous, what we see as a ridiculous price, but other people apparently don't think is, is that ridiculous. Um, that sort of covers the, the effort involved in putting one together. So you can maybe do some math and try to figure out how much time is involved and, and whether it's worth your time. Um, but we're at makerbot.com and there's another uh, address that's not here and that's, um, that's the other one which we were discussing earlier, that's thingiverse.com. Uh, makerbot.com is our store and uh, links to our wiki which has the full documentation for how to put the thing together, links to all you know the files to actually burn the firmware, etc. Uh, Thingiverse is the companion site that has all the objects that you're going to print out that will make you cool. Um, so, And we have flyers up front that have both those addresses on there. Um, and I think now, now I think we'd like to actually do a print so we have some time. So Zach here is going to uh, is going to fire up a print for us. What are we printing? We do box. Since we don't have one right now. So Zach was saving one of those uh, twisted uh, screwable boxes to give to his grandma when he visited her this week, and uh, and I think he lost it. So we're going to have to print out another one. Um, so this is a case where MakerBot will be making at least someone's grandma happy which again, I don't think most open source projects have really done yet. <laughs> so it's, right now it's raising up the, build, the, uh, the extruder. And what it's going to do now is it's gonna wait a few seconds, it's gonna heat up the nozzle. There's a little thermistor on the tip of the nozzle that monitors the temperature of the nozzle. Once it gets up to about uh, 220 degrees, it'll start the motor on the extruder, which will start basically turning a, um, a gear that pinches the ABS and forces it through that nozzle. And once it does, it'll do a little five-second extrusion, and a little noodle of, uh, of plastic will appear. And this time, we remove the tweezers so we don't have to print them out. This is always the tensest moment. Will it work? Actually, the real tensest moment is going to come in you know, after we do the test extrusion. I'll talk about that in a second. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, start asking. Um, that's a really good question. No, oh, sorry. The question was, is there a difference in the speed at which we can extrude different materials? And uh, the answer I have for you is that we haven't really experimented too much. Uh, primarily, we've been working with PLA, 
at very similar parameters to what we've been extruding ABS with. Um, my initial answer would be possibly yes, <laughs> but um, yeah, it is the flow rate of the polymer that's gonna, okay, so this is actually the real tensest moment here. Uh, like I say, ABS really likes to stick to itself rather than anything else. And so the first thing we do is we lay down a raft of ABS, which is just a rectangle of ABS that we put directly down on the build base as close to the actual base as we can. Um, and so sometimes we have to adjust the height a little bit to make sure we got it at the correct thickness. So that it looks like this one's going really well. Um, and after it prints out this, which is these uh, horizontal lines, which will adhere to the base well, it's going to print out some very thin vertical lines. And it's going to do that by moving the, the head very quickly, which will stretch out the extrusion and give you a thinner uh, line. And the reason we do that is because we want to be able to remove the build base once you've actually created your object. And so by creating those little thin stripes, you can fairly easily peel that build base off. Um, so yeah, like Zach says, it's, it's dependent on the flow rate of the material, and we have not done that much experimentation with it yet. We've, uh, ooh, this is also our, our loudest machine, I have to warn you. The, the new ones, we're starting to use uh, new, uh, new stepper chips, stepper driver chips that do micro-stepping, and those are actually much quieter. Uh, the primary noise you're hearing right now is most likely the rods rattling around because these are also not the smoother rods. Um, but the machines are actually getting quieter as time goes on. And if people want to just come up here and, and watch. Okay, sorry, question. So uh, how about different heads? You basically got a 3D CNC platform there. Can mm -hmm. I mount something other than the extruder? Uh, the only other extruder we've done so far is the frosting extruder. Uh, which we've used to decorate cupcakes, which will get you free drinks at bars, at least. Um, but um, yeah, again, we don't know what people are going to do with this. Some people have already, there's on Thingiverse, in fact, I can probably find it within the first page or so. But somebody just recently started designing a mount for a Dremel tool to sit on that platform. And uh, I don't know if they've tested it out yet, but what you're hearing right now that this is. This is it's doing straight line motion because what's just done is it's drawn the outline of the bottom of that box and now it's doing the infill layer. It's actually filling in the, the bottom of that box to form a solid base. It's, well, it's not really infill. Infill is what we do between solid layers, but it's, doing, it's building the base. And after you work with these things for enough, you can actually sort of recognize what they're printing by, by the sound. So this is, a, yeah, this is one of our more prolific kind of contributors and he's actually designed a base that you can use, that you can bolt onto this base there, that will hold a Dremel tool. So presumably he's going to try to start milling with that as soon as he gets one up and running. Um, we have about a tenth of a millimeter on the X and Y axes, and um, the Z axis is probably around, I think probably better than that, but um, the real limitation on the Z axis is the layer height. Um, we usually use about 0.2 millimeters of plastic per layer. You could try to get a, a thinner layer height. You can move the head faster and that would stretch out the extrusion. You'd have a, a, a thinner layer, but uh, your prints would also start taking longer and longer. So, Do people want to watch this? Because it's kind of cool to actually watch. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So there is tweaking when you're initially playing with this. You need to essentially set up, uh, tweak the parameters until you get a good build. This is the one that's your question, because we are looking at coming up with a pattern so people can more use the calibrated machines. Right now the calibration pattern tends to be more of a to, all right, I did a print. Extrusion's going to be out too thin, getting very thin to Right, and tweak this, tweak that. Um, and, it costs a lot. and it's more parts for us to pack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, this guy. The tool chain. Um, I've been working on Replicator G mostly lately. I'm going to start to integrate Scheme 4 into Replicator G so you can actually run it.